Mark Antony was not positively influenced by the Queen of Egypt, Cleopatra VII. Plutarch writes, He fell into the snare, thus, when making preparation for the Parthian War, he sent to command her to make her personal appearance in Cilicia, to answer an accusation that she had given great assistance in the late wars to Cassius. She was to meet Antony in the time of life when women's beauty is most splendid and their intellects are in full maturity. She came sailing up the river Sidnus in a barge with gilded stern and outspread sails of purple, while oars of silver beat time to the music of flutes and fifes and harps. She herself lay all along under a canopy of cloth of gold, dressed as Venus in a picture, and beautiful young boys like painted cupids stood on each side to fan her. The word went through all the multitude that Venus had come to feast with Bacchus for the common good of Asia. Now, the two of them entertain each other, fight over hosting each other, and try to outdo one another in the lavishness of their feasts and revelries. Plutarch writes later, a little satirically, I think, Plato admits four sorts of flattery, but she had a thousand. This is what Plutarch writes of Cleopatra. Regarding Antony, there's this weird dimension that Plutarch adds with this detail. He would go rambling through the streets dressed like a servant, and he often came home very scurvily answered and sometimes even beaten severely. Mark Antony actually enjoys being made fun of. He likes raillery. So there seems to be a bit of a masochist in Mark Antony. Shakespeare latches on to this. Let's get these lines. Rail thou, he says to a messenger, and taunt my faults. With such full license as both truth and malice have power to utter. That's what he's saying. He wants this messenger to make fun of him. A peculiarity, indeed, in Mark Antony. But back to his relationship with Cleopatra. Antony was so captivated by her that he could yet suffer himself to be carried away by her to Alexandria, there to keep holiday like a boy, in play and diversion, squandering and fooling away in enjoyments that most costly of all valuables, time. And while he's frittering away this time, Rome is in shambles. It is in upheaval. It is experiencing famine. The people of Rome and the people of Italy are coming to regret the change of governments. Now, remember that these people, disaffected with Pompey, had watched Caesar run him out of the country. Now that the Republic is lost, the Republic is finally mourned. They finally see what it's like to live under this. And the concept, actually, interestingly, of you don't know what you've got till it's gone is, is actually a theme in Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. Antony himself, in Act 1, Scene 2, says, are slippery people whose love is never linked to the deserver till his deserts are past, begin to throw Pompey the Great and all his dignities upon his son. Okay, so now we have to mention Sextus Pompeius, Pompey's son. Now, people flock to him. This is true. However, it's not merely out of some tardy bestowal of praise upon his father, but because there were very real issues in Italy for this, we're going to have to turn to people like Cassius Dio and the historian Appian. First is the distress that is caused by the settlement of 34 legions. Octavian transforms Italy into a military residence in which his soldiers receive all preference to boot people off of their land. Some people are displaced by direct ordinance, but others get screwed when the soldiers take by force more than what was given to them. Appian says Octavian was not in love with this, but he has to do this in order to retain their loyalty, and he doesn't have the political leverage to stop this. Antony is disadvantaged in all of this because he's off in Asia, and so the soldiers do not associate these gifts with Antony. They associate it with Octavian. And the disaffected go to Sextus Pompeius. Appian writes, People who feared for their lives or were being robbed of their property turned above all to him. That is Pompey's son, Sextus Pompeius. 
and he accumulates a large fleet and Appian believes actually that this guy could have conquered Italy if he had landed because of the widespread famine. And this next part is interesting. This is from Appian. The inhabitants of Rome shared their grief and wept over their fate. This is, this is them finally ruining the fall of the Republic. They wept over their fate, particularly so when they reflected that it was not on behalf of Rome, but as a check on themselves and to secure a change of constitution that the war had taken place. The rewards of victory had been given and the colonies had been established with the purpose of preventing the Republic from ever again lifting its head because mercenaries ready to do the bidding of the men in power had been settled alongside them. Mercenaries scattered throughout Italy, Appian writes, instead of serving the common interest, they served only the men who had enlisted them and even so not under compulsion of the law, but by private inducements. All these factors undermined military discipline, civil conflict engulfed everything, and the armies became unmanageable. One of the hallmarks of tyrannical regimes is the fungible nature of its laws. We call it the arbitrary rule of law. It's more like it's fungible. They'll bend it. Tyrannies bend the law. The courts are bent whether or not to suit some political aim or a social aim. Another hallmark, of course, is economic failure. Rome was suffering from famine. What food there was was confiscated for military needs. So now we have to set aside Sextus Pompeius. It is actually Mark Antony's brother, Lucius, who takes up the cause of the restoration of the Republic. Lucius seems to be not much like Mark Antony. Appian writes, Lucius held Republican views and disapproved of the triumvirate. The farmers who had lost their land sought protection from any powerful man, but Lucius was the only one who listened to them. Now, these next lines from Appian are informative as to the immediacy of the moment, the opportunity that Antony squanders while he's off in the arms of Cleopatra. Not that he likes Republican government. We know he wants to be a despot too, but this is still a moment that he squanders. And this is what's going on of great seriousness. Well, he's thinking of nothing serious. His wife, Fulvia, is collaborating with his brother. Matters of great import and urgency to the future of the country. Fulvia criticized him, as in Lucius, for fomenting a war at the wrong time. Right, that's, that's from the Appian. We, I want to read between the lines a little bit here, because Appian doesn't state it directly. But the idea of fomenting a war at the wrong time... What she means, what I think is meant is that it was the wrong time because her husband was useless to the cause over in Alexandria. So that was her stance until Manius maliciously put the matter in a different light by pointing out that if Italy remained at peace, Antonius, as in Antony, would stay with Cleopatra. But if there was a war, he would come back without delay. Fulvia, her woman's passions aroused, incited Lucius to pick a quarrel. So that guy's sort of playing her, right? Her husband, Antony, is with Cleopatra, and she figures this is a way to get him back. The lines that follow from Appian suggest that Fulvia and Lucius had an intent to oppose the triumvirate, but requiring the support of the troops, right? The troops are interested in the tyranny, right? right? They can't be inspired with removing the, the empire and restoring the Republic. So what they do is they make it seem like Octavian is going up against Antony. Okay, so Lucius raises his legions. A state of war existed in all the provinces which had fallen to Octavian. The sympathies of the Italians were overwhelmingly with Lucius because he was fighting for them against the assignees of their land. They killed or expelled from the town's Octavian's agents, manned their walls, and joined Lucius. Lucius took Rome with three cohorts. He addressed a public meeting in Rome, saying that his brother would willingly lay his authority aside in exchange for the consulship and take legal and traditional instead of illegal and arbitrary power. Everyone was delighted by what he said. Lucius was given the title of commander-in-chief by the people. So Lucius marches out. But the problem is, is that he becomes trapped. He becomes trapped in the city of Perugia and surrounded by Octavian's armies. The bitterness of this ensuing struggle and the harrowing rapidity with which the forces of military dictatorship enveloped and strangled this uprising can all be seen in Appian's words. The city of Perugia was surrounded with a ditch and rampart 
creating a circuit of seven miles, extending long arms to the Tiber so that nothing could be brought in. Two of Antony's commanders, Asimius and Ventidius, advanced to relieve Lucius, but they, however, when Agrippa met them with a larger force, were afraid of being encircled and turned aside to a place called Fulginium, there, surrounded by Agrippa and his forces. These armies of Octavian are like ants swarming the prey. They're like an enveloping black cloud that just swallows up the resistance. It is unsettling, I think, to read these lines, to see the uh, engines of authoritarianism in their full stifling force. You couldn't venture out with your army. So vast and outmaneuvering are these troops. So Lucius's men are starving, surrounded by Octavian's ramparts. Inside, the legionary troops pleaded with Lucius to make another attempt on the fortifications. He declared that they must now either surrender or, if they considered surrender worse than death, fight to the death. They launched their attack with great energy, made their way over the stakes, and reached the ramparts. The drawbridges were let down at various places on the wall, and they fought on them with missiles and darts being shot obliquely at them from all directions. In spite of this, they forced their way across, and a few jumped onto the wall. But the best of Octavian's reserves managed to throw Lucius's men off their walls, totally broken. Although they could no longer raise a shout, their commitment made them stand their ground. Lucius, taking pity on their condition, sounded the trumpet for retreat. Octavian's troops were delighted by this and clashed their weapons together as if they had won. Consequently, Lucius's were roused to fury, seized the ladders again, and carried them wildly to the wall, but did no damage as they no longer had the strength. Lucius went to them, begging them not to go on fighting to the last gasp. Such was the way in which this violently contested battle at the fortifications came to an end. This was the spirit of resistance against the tyranny, the martyrs of history. This was the last gasp of Republican freedom in Italy. And what a way to go. The desperation and the courage just pours off the page in the Appian. It's, it's really inc incredible reading. Now, Lucius was spared, but not everyone else. Cassius Dio writes, Most of the senators and knights were put to death. And the story goes that they did not merely suffer death in an ordinary form, but were led to the altar consecrated to the former Caesar and were there sacrificed. These rebels against the Roman imperial sway were sacrificed like animals at the shrine of the deified Julius Caesar. They were sacrificed to the shrine of a despot, a dead tyrant. Within this uprising in Italy, as we have said, many of the towns walled out Octavian. The captain of the garrison of, of Campania was this guy named Tiberius Claudius Nero, and he was married to Livia Drusilla. They already had a son, Tiberius. Livia Drusilla would go on to meet Octavian and marry him while still pregnant, and she would eventually give birth to her second son, Nero Drusus. He must have been really taken with her. He gets rid of his own wife, even though she would eventually give birth to Octavian's only child, Julia so now while we're talking about wives, Mark Antony returns to Italy in order to patch up his alliance with Octavian. Antony is no Republican like his brother. And actually what winds up happening is that during this period, as Antony returns to Italy, his wife, Fulvia, dies. And Antony is remarried Octavian's sister. He is committed to the triumvirate, especially at a time such as this, when it has threats in various places. At this point, uh, Sextus Pompeius has not yet been dealt with and a Parthian war is breaking out in the east. And for a time, it looks like Antony is freed of Cleopatra's clutches. Plutarch makes it sound like people were hopeful that he had made a turn for the better because at this point, even Octavian kind of needs him. But Plutarch writes this as Antony takes off with his wife. But the mischief that thus long had lain still, the passion for Cleopatra which better thoughts had seemed to have lulled and charmed into oblivion upon this approach to Syria gathered strength again. So as he goes off to deal with the Parthian menace, these thoughts of Cleopatra come back. But it has to be said, in the meantime, 
he impregnates his wife and he spends time in Athens with Octavia. People do have reason for hope. The offspring by this marriage between Octavia and Antony are significant because this is part of the family tree of the Roman imperial family. All right, so he goes off to deal with the Parthians. The Parthians have advanced into the Roman eastern provinces. And even in Judea, the Parthians have placed Antigonus in control of Jerusalem. And Herod, with the help of Antony, takes back Jerusalem after a siege in 37 BC. And Antigonus's head is chopped off. Mark Antony then marches across Arabia and into Armenia, assembling this massive army. And he gifts to Cleopatra Phoenicia, Coela Syria, Cyprus, a great part of Cilicia, and the side of Judea that produces a bomb. And this is what Plutarch writes at the, at the end of his creation of this army. There appeared 60,000 Roman foot, 10,000 horse, and of other nations, horse and foot, 30,000. And these great preparations that put the Indians beyond Bactria into alarm and made all Asia shake were all we are told, rendered useless to him because of Cleopatra. For in order to pass the winter with her, the war was pushed on before its due time, and all he did was done without perfect consideration as by a man whose object was much more to hasten his return than to conquer his enemies. This is how pathetic he is. His demise is going to be pretty sad to watch. So as he marches into Parthia, which is modern-day Iran, and he crosses that what we would consider the eastern Turkish border, so stupid is Antony in wanting to wage this war quickly and get back to Cleopatra that he leaves behind these siege engines that he doesn't think he's going to need. And he thinks they're slowing him down, right? He wants to get home to his darling, so he wants to be able to move faster. He leaves these siege engines behind and he arrives at the city of Frada, which is the principal city in the kingdom of Media. Then he realizes he needs them and he wastes a whole bunch of time building these mounds. And yet when he wants to go and reclaim them, he finds out that the Parthians have attacked them and destroyed them. And 10,000 of his men were slain who had stayed behind. So the Parthian army under Phraates comes up to Antony's camp. And whatever an affront is, that's what they do. That's what Plutarch says. And so Antony takes a whole bunch of his troops and he marches a day's march away from his camp and hoping to draw them into battle. And he does. And he technically wins. But as they, even after they chase them for 50 furlongs, they only see that they have four score slain. So even with this, this is the closest thing they have to a victory while they're actually on offense and it really does nothing. They have the same issues that Crassus had. It's hard to get the Parthians to fight you in a pitched open battle. They just keep retreating. And as winter is coming, Antony's men have to forage for food, which they cannot do without danger of ambush. And the Parthians are cold and they want to go home. The Romans retreat, but as they retreat, they're followed and harassed by the Parthian army. In one engagement, 3,000 were killed and 5,000 wounded. But as Mark Antony went around visiting his wounded troops, we get another glimpse from Plutarch as to his popularity with the men. As for the obedience and affectionate respect they bore their general, and in the unanimous feeling amongst small and great alike officers and common soldiers to prefer his good opinion of them to their very lives. So the retreat continues, and the men in their desperation eat a plant they shouldn't, right? They find this strange herb that they eat when they're starving. And these are the lines from Plutarch. They chanced upon an herb that was mortal, First taking away all sense and understanding, he that had eaten of it remembered nothing in the world and employed himself only in moving great stones from one place to another. Through all the camp there was nothing to be seen but men grubbing upon the ground at stones. That's quite a sight. Okay, So they have to fight their way back to Armenia. Here, Antony, making a review of his army, found that he had lost 20,000 foot and 4,000 horse of which the better half perished not by the enemy, but by diseases. Their march was of 27 days from Frata, during which they had beaten the Parthians in 18 battles, though with little effect. This war was a real defeat. 
So Antony continues in his return to Alexandria and came with much diminished numbers to a place called the White Village, where he waited for the arrival of Cleopatra. And being impatient of the delay she made, he bethought himself of shortening the time in wine and drunkenness, and yet could not endure the tediousness of a meal, but would start from table and run to see if she were coming, till at last she came into port. So fawning this guy is over her. Okay, what was so great about Cleopatra? We have, it's got to be wondered, because there are a lot of women in the world, and this wasn't Antony's behavior always. What the hell has happened here? Here's what Plutarch says about her. Her actual beauty, it is said, was not in itself so remarkable that none could be compared with her, or that no one could see her without being struck by it, but the contact of her presence, if you lived with her, was irresistible. She could pass from one language to another. But this is additionally remarkable when we see what people said about Octavia. Plutarch calls her a wonder of a woman. And here, here are the lines. The Romans pitied Antony himself, Plutarch writes, and more particularly those who had seen Cleopatra, whom they could report to have no way the advantage of Octavia, either in youth or in beauty. What the hell? Here's Shakespeare's take on it. Um, and a barbus says, um, act two, scene two from Antony and Cleopatra. Other women cloy the appetites they feed, but she makes hungry where most she satisfies. For vilest things become themselves in her, that the holy priests bless her when she is riggish. Riggish, my footnote says, means acts like a slut. <laughs> riggish. Let's put that. Let's put that up there. Isn't that fun? Oh, while we're at it. Um, to another Shakespeare word, unseminard is what they call the castrated eunuch. Unseminard is Shakespeare's word for castrated. And one last thing. Do we hear the Dante in those words? She makes hungry where she most satisfies. When Virgil explains the nature of greed, when she eats, she's hungriest. Oh, and also, I like Shakespeare's explanation. The other thing, what was the other part of this? Okay. For vilest things become themselves in her. So his explanation is that she's, she's a bit of a riggish, a riggish hooker. I think what Shakespeare is saying is she just pulls it off. No reason to explain it. She just pulls it off. So the next thing left is for Antony to take on Octavian. So for this, we have to go back to Rome for a moment. In the war with Pompeius, Octavian wins with the help of Lepidus, that other member of the second triumvirate. But they fall out over Sicily. Lepidus tries to seize control of the island arguing that he has taken more towns. Now, we must remember that Lepidus was pushed aside by Mark Antony, and his troops deserted him and went over to Antony back in the last video. The same thing happens to him again with Octavian. Appian says it is a result of Lepidus' laziness. Just as it had happened in Cisalpine Gaul with, with Antony, Octavian enters Lepidus' camp and convinces his men to join him. There is a brief exchange of violence, but finally, the last to go were the cavalry, who sent a messenger to Octavian to inquire if they should kill Lepidus. However, Lepidus is spared. As we, as we view a historical period in which military affairs dominate more than they do now, it interests us to see the importance of leadership skills in a more blunt demonstration than we see today. And like Crassus before, Lepidus is clearly the weakest leader of men at arms in the second triumvirate. So his life is spared and he, and he is removed. Only Octavian and Antony are left standing as rulers in this new empire. All right. So as we see from Cassius Dio, there is now arson all over Italy because of this new tax burden in the city and in the countryside, many buildings are being burned down. Free men being called upon to pay a fourth part of their incomes and freed slaves an eighth of their property. I find it interesting, right? So Plutarch had accused the Italians of taking this tyranny lying down in the life of Julius Caesar, that they had submitted to the fact of tyranny, but not the name of king. But here we find that there is a little bit of resistance in them. Over a 25% tax? That's pretty standard in America. They burn buildings down over that in Italy. So they do offer up some resistance. And we find Plutarch writes, This is looked upon as one of the greatest of Ant Antony's oversights, that he did not then press the war. 
for he allowed time at once for Caesar to make his preparations and for the commotions to pass over. For while people were having their money called for, they were mutinous and violent, but having paid it, they held their peace. Uh, isn't that funny? And we do that even today here in America. Our tax day and our election day are as far away from each other on the calendar as they could possibly be. That's funny. So Octavian and Antony, they finally come to it. And they make up their own reasons why the other person has been in breach of the triumvirate. But it was the reading of Antony's will in Rome that truly turned to the people of the city against him. Cassius Dio writes, Antony testified to Caesarian that he was without doubt Julius Caesar's son had made enormous settlements upon his children by the Egyptian queen whom he was bringing up and had ordered that his body should be buried in Alexandria by Cleopatra's side. The Romans were so outraged by these disclosures that they were willing to believe that other rumors current at the time were equally true, namely that if Antony were victorious, he would hand over the city of Rome to Cleopatra and transfer the seat of government to Egypt. So... They're going to go to war. Cassius Dio writes, The preparations far exceeded anything that had been seen before. In many ways, this is a world war because it engulfs all of the Roman provinces and all of these distant countries. And this includes, as we've been talking about Josephus a little bit, this technically includes Herod the Jew, right? I'm, if that sounded bad, that's how Plutarch writes it. But he actually doesn't take part in the battle. As we learn in Josephus, Herod is actually sent by Cleopatra uh, to fight against the Arabs. All right. So they all come to this, this war. And as, as Plutarch tells us, and Cassius Dio backs him up, it was Cleopatra's idea to fight a naval battle when Antony's soldiers should have been superior on land against Octavians. I don't know about that. Plutarch is right to say that the advantage at sea belongs to Octavian. We've skipped this in the interest of time, but Octavian fights and wins a protracted war against Sextus Pompeius that is largely at sea, fighting over those, ba uh, those islands like Sardinia, Sicily, Corsica, right? They've been fighting it out in the Mediterranean at sea. Octavian, though, we've seen the machinery against Lucius, and that's exactly how this is going to go, this enveloping strategy. Caesar seized his opportunity across the Ionian Sea, securing himself a place at Ipirus called the Ladle. Cassius Dio also reports a series of maneuvers by Octavian and by Agrippa trapping Antony's fleet in the Ambracian Gulf, just like his brother had been trapped at Pelusia, just like Ventidius had been trapped. They are an engulfing, enveloping force. And so he has to fight his way through. Cassius Dio seems to imply that the strategy is that they just wanted to burrow a hole through the lines, and then, and then sail home. Either way, he's forced into fighting the real battle. Antony has the larger ships filled with an infantry that is veteran and going completely to waste, and Octavian has smaller ships that are much more maneuverable. So the battle begins, and it is hard fought, and apparently it is very much in flux at the moment when Cleopatra raises her sails and flees. Plutarch writes, but the fortune of the day was still undecided, and the battle equal, when on a sudden Cleopatra's sixty ships were seen hoisting sail and making out to sea in full flight, right through the ships that were engaged. Here it was that Antony showed to all the world that he was no longer actuated by the thoughts and motives of a commander or a man. As soon as he saw her ship sailing away, he abandoned all that were fighting and spending their lives for him to follow her. But I wonder if this battle ever really was in doubt when we see these lines in Book 50 of Cassius Dio. As the fighting remained evenly balanced, Octavian, who found himself in doubt what to do next, sent for fire from his camp. Until then, he had been unwilling to use it since he was anxious to capture Antony's treasure intact. All right, so he's been fighting this with one hand behind his back. This is what happens when he decides to shoot flames at their boats. It just reads like this was never in doubt. This is from Cassius Dio. The attackers would approach their targets from many different points at once, bombarding them with blazing missiles. From a longer range, they would also catapult jars filled with charcoal or pitch. They ignited the timbers and immediately started ablaze as is bound to happen on a ship. 
So long as only a section of the ship was on fire, the men would stand close by and jump into it, cutting away some of the planks and scattering others. In some instances, the men threw the timbers into the sea. Some, especially the sailors, were overcome by the smoke before the flames ever came near them, while others were roasted in the midst of the holocaust as if they were in ovens. Others were incinerated in their armor as it grew red hot. Others, again, to avoid such a fate, or when they were half burned, threw off their armor and were wounded by the missiles shot at them from long range, or jumped into the sea and were drowned, or were clubbed by their enemies and sank, or were devoured by sea monsters. The only men to find a death which was endurable in the midst of such sufferings were those who either killed one another in return for the service, or took their own lives before such a fate could befall them. So he goes back to Alexandria and he makes a further resistance there against Octavian. But when that happens, things get a little worse for Antony. On the day that there's going to be this battle, there he stood in expectation of the event. But as soon as the fleets came near to one another, his men saluted Caesars with their oars. And on their responding, the whole body of the ships, forming into a single fleet, rode up direct to the city. Antony had no sooner seen this, but the horse deserted him and went over to Caesar, and his foot being defeated, he retired into the city. At this point, this is when Cleopatra flees into her monument and sends word to him that she is dead. And he runs himself through the belly with a sword, but unfortunately, the wound was not immediately mortal. While he's dying... Of this wound, he learns that Cleopatra had lied to him. She's still alive. And so, he eagerly gave order to the servants to take him up and in their arms was carried to the door of the building. Cleopatra would not open the door, but looking from a sort of window, she let down ropes. If, this, if he wasn't disillusioned in these last moments, I don't know how he ever could have been. So he gets raised up and with her in her monument... He slowly dies, and shortly afterwards, Cleopatra has an audience with Octavian, but she will eventually take her own life using the poison of a snake. This is the ending of Antony. Everyone's gone. No more Pompeius. No more Antony. No more Cicero. No more Caesar. No more Cato. No more Scipio. No more Brutus. No more Cassius. Octavian has outlived and beat them all.